Hey humans, I'm Polis from Kinetic Podcast, and today we sit down with Ryan Dorty, who's a president at Hemp Ventures and the focus on decortication and hemp fiber processing. This one's going to be an educational one, and you're going to be able to learn about the supply chain of the hemp markets, what's really possible, what's out there, and what's coming in the near future. Hopefully you guys enjoy. Please subscribe and share because this helps to grow the channel with all the algorithm going on and having Canna in your keyword. Uh, the algorithm gods definitely don't favor that. So I'll catch you on the other side. Ryan. Bam. Thanks for coming on. Uh, we've been planning to do this for a while. And the uh, funny thing is you're actually one of my first friends in Denver that uh, opened my eyes to fiber, hemp, and just in general, like the cannabis in industry itself. But um, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, so let's get into the beginnings, how you got started with hemp, because it's very interesting. You're my age and uh, it's good to have a friend that's also motivated, just like yourself. And in doing something good for the world. Uh, so how did you get started with hemp and the whole industry? And how did you learn in such a young age? Yeah, um, I, I've had a long interest in, uh, you know, the um, cannabis plant as a whole, and uh, spent some time at University of Colorado in Boulder, where they were doing um, uh, the genome project and looking at the different genetics of, of hemp and how that affected the outcome of the plant and things of that nature. And I actually went to uh, graduated from James Madison University in Virginia during uh, the time where they were doing the university trial tests in uh, Virginia. And my university was growing um, industrial hemp varieties with a number of farmers. And that's how I got uh, first introduced to hemp uh, cultivation on a larger scale. And through that, um, I was able to get hired from a group um, that employed me to research uh, opportunities in the industrial hemp sector. Um, and at that time, I was the president of my uh, entrepreneurship club and supply chain management club, and I love building business plans. I was more focused on um, getting into the sustainable energy field, uh, which led me into hemp fields. Um, and that is how I uh, first got introduced on a larger scale. My, the state of Virginia was looking at applications and it's ironic because the state of Virginia is the historical hub of hemp cultivation here in North America and I grew up in Northern Virginia uh, you know um, researching and learning about George Washington and the hemp history there and so I was already uh, very interested in this just fueled that fire um, with my university looking further into it and me having previous knowledge of cannabis and that kind of culmination really drew me towards the industry um, and I, out of college I started the Virginia a hemp company with a group of investors out of Northern Virginia, and they gave me a uh, large budget to do more research. And that's how I kind of got the um, opportunity to go to Europe and see uh, a lot of this fiber processing technology from Dunagro and from Hemp Flax and other uh, industry leaders over there uh, that are far ahead at the time because hemp wasn't even legal here. And that's kind of how I got a uh, insight into where the industry might be going. Um, and then after the 2018 Farm Bill and, and legislation did pass, I was already at that time working at the largest hemp fiber processing company um, in North America, who are no longer uh, active. But uh, that combined has given me um, a leg up uh, and a very quick education in the space and able to put together what I've, what I've been able to do here um, and, and work on what we're working towards. Um, can you talk a little bit about the genome project? You said it was in Virginia or was it in Boulder? That was, that was at University of Colorado in Boulder. Oh. And that's, they were studying uh, um, uh, medicinal cannabis is much more prevalent out here. And they were looking at kind of um, the difference between what genetics uh, regarding the plants, you know, makeup affected the medicine that the plant created or what the outcome of the plant was really getting to the bottom of um what these uh um cultivars create specifically uh so they can isolate medicines better and things of that nature but also they were looking at other cultivars entirely there, there's a huge application for the cannabis plant as a whole uh it's kind of weird that colleges are doing this research is this did you see a switch when you graduated from university a lot of more i guess schools are interested in hemp or is that more towards the states that are like colorado it's legal here they're more likely open to maybe integrating some sort of hemp or cannabis program for yeah. that 
there's I think there's been a really big transition since the law changed uh, before 2018. Not many uh, universities wanted to be involved. Um, that's actually how I got the opportunity that I did. The, the group that wanted to do this research came to the university first and the university said, no, we're not interested. You can talk to the entrepreneurship club and the entrepreneurship counselor at the time told them no, but you can talk to our entrepreneurship club president because I think he knows something about cannabis. And uh, that's how I got in with these groups. So you had to have uh, um, lucky or, or you know, uh, finagle your way to get these opportunities before, but now they are becoming more prevalent. There's uh, University of Oregon, to uh, several other universities in, in Philadelphia, Thomas Jefferson University, and several others are taking a, uh, um, you know, a, a point to bring more hemp uh, research and education to their campuses, and, and to, you know, if they see the benefit for the state long term, the universities will will invest. And up until this point, it's been um, rather precarious and, and hard to judge where that's going to go. But with with the passing of the federal federal bill it uh, seems much more likely that it's something to invest their time into. Um, I want to cover a few things. Uh, did you start working for the, the biggest uh, hemp uh, company or what is it, the corticating company, right, in the United States before you went on the trip to Europe or was that after? It, it was long after. Um, we, Can you talk about the trip in Europe? What, what did you learn about the whole processing and the supply chain? Sure. Um, well, in Europe, uh, I mean, hemp, hemp has had... Uh, immense you know um cultivation around the world throughout history and uh it's kind of gone on and off with being um you know a very important cash crop to being kind of a sideline thing to being uh playing different roles in different societies around the world and and their processing technologies differ around the world and uh there's you know a lot of interest to look at these technologies because they have either unbroken technological advancement or they've been doing it a lot longer. Um, but, you know, in my mind, they, they just do it differently. Um, but going to Europe, we were able to see a um, semi more mature industry that has, uh, you know, practice cultivation techniques for a long time and has harvesting techniques and, and processing techniques that are much more established, but many of them are not um, optimized. They're, they're designed for, other industries and have been um, adapted to processing hemp. Uh, hemp is a bast fiber plant and uh, you know there's several other bast fiber plants that are used for their uh, that are cultivated for their fiber or for their inner woody core. Um, the most predominant one in Europe is flax and uh, you know Belgium is, is a flax processing capital of the world and you know the Netherlands and Belgium and France and Germany happen to be the largest western uh, European nations that cultivate hemp as well, um, but they do it n not on a scale that would justify investing much more into their existing uh, fiber technology, fiber processing technologies. And that's Europe in particular. Um, a lot of their fiber processing technologies they currently use now are also um, adapted and uh, um, made from uh, machinery that they used to use for recycling. Uh, recycling is very uh, much more predominant industry in Europe and they have much further technologies to make higher use products out of their waste materials a lot of that was developed after World War II because a lot of European nations didn't have any raw materials to use and so they had to get very good at recycling and a lot of that technology is what's been adapted and um, I got to see that and, and understand that and then also compare that to um, more rudimentary or uh, less advanced processing technologies, more labor intensive practices uh, of uh, the Eastern European and Asian countries. Um, basically, hemp has been processed by hand for 40,000 years, and some countries add a level of automation to it or um, technological innovation that makes it easier and cheaper, um, but that is uh, something I believe can be drastically improved upon after seeing the systems in Europe. And there's not really agreed upon best way to do it in Europe. Um, you know, they're doing it different uh, country by country um, and, and, you know, manufacturer to manufacturer of these different machines. There's different processes to get different end products. Um, but I don't believe it's optimized. And then the ways they do it in Asian nations um, or, you know, in uh, 
uh, traditionally in China and other areas, uh, it's, it's very labor intensive. So there are manufacturing methods that can't really be adapted to the United States. So that, uh, you know, that trip uh, before really gave me insight into what is available and on the market today and, and where the opportunities for improvement lie. And that's what, you know, we've, we've focused on as a company to improve that here in the United States. What did you start doing uh, right after you came back from Europe? Because that was probably like a, a shock, not only like a culture shock, but just in, in overloaded with information and history as well. Um, and what did you see, I guess, the missing gaps in the United States and how you could fill those up? Yeah. Um, w well, when we came back, we initially were looking to um, bring back that technology, mm -hmm. uh, a um, simple cleaning and decortication line. Uh, we were looking to install in Virginia. We kind of more so uh, adapted their plan to uh, just bring it over here. Um, and so that was initially our, our uh, kind of reaction was great. These guys know how to do it. Let's, let's install that over here. But unfortunately that year um, in 2018, uh, the state of Virginia wasn't um, looking to be a pioneer in the space and looking to allow uh, independent companies for profit to grow um, and, and put farmers at risk of having their plant either go hot and there was no crop insurance and all those kinds of things. So they had a limited acreage amount and certain stipulations that hindered us. Um, so more than anything, uh, we found out that we need to figure out what grows here in the United States. They have established cultivars in, in Europe and other places and they actually, um, they grow predominantly dual purpose crops, which are going to have a uh, two applications. And so the fiber and the herd are um, a lower, you know, value is able to be made from them and, and still make it make sense over there. Uh, and that, that's in some regions, some places they do grow predominantly, uh, you know, specifically purpose fiber. But that, that is uh, what kind of uh, we came back with is is technologies processing is out there it, it can be improved upon greatly um and then on top of that we figured out that it's it's of paramount importance to find the genetics that are necessary to produce the products that we were looking to uh to manufacture and you have to establish that region by region and so um you know, that's what kind of led me to looking for someone who had already had a foothold in a region and had larger state support and um, where things were moving faster because a lot of this is being hindered by uh, rules and regulations and red tape. And that is what led me to uh, relocating and, and out to Kentucky and working for a pretty established fiber processor. Um, and they had a leg up because they were one located in Kentucky, but also they had a lot of previous experience working with other natural fibers. Kentucky um, is one of the pioneering states as well, right? Yeah, as far as historically. Origi originally yeah. tobacco and then uh, right. hemp as well, right? Well, I mean, originally it was hemp and then I mean, I, it's, it's hard to, um, hemp, Kentucky was a huge hemp producer. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, historically Thomas Jefferson, you know, wanted people out there producing hemp and corn and they produced so much that they had lots of excess that they turned the corn into into whiskey and they turn the hemp into plenty of other uh, materials needed for the frontier lifestyle. But that was um, definitely an area with strong hemp culture. And, you know, it used to be the largest uh, hemp rope walking facilities were located there back in the 1800s. The first millionaire west of the Alleghenies was a hemp farmer um, from Kentucky. And so those kinds of things have given it a, uh, notoriety and, and people are aware of you know the hemp application uh without you having to educate them of the new you know what we're doing with it now um i wanted to track back a little bit obviously you mentioned herd and fiber we're gonna go we're gonna go through it but uh since you're working with decortication can you run us through like a decortication 101 uh what it does for hemp processing what can you get out of it and the use of for it yeah yeah, yeah. i mean it's, it's one thing to, to lead into that is, is to um, kind of uh, not every hemp plant might be best fit for decortication. Um, and what do you mean by that? So there's, there's different cultivars of hemp, obviously, um, but there are um, 
bred in certain ways, particularly you could have a same genetic bred in two different ways and planted in different densities and different um, spacing and it'll react differently and have different characteristics. Um, I, the best crop ideal for decortication is a, a single stock with minimal branching. And so we're talking about a, a fiber or a, um, you know, a, a dual purpose variety that's gonna have a, a long single stock um, and then either a flower or grain at the top. Uh, traditionally, the most predominant grown uh, um, hemp cultivar grown here, is, like there are tons of them, but the, the main purpose is for floral production or for cannabinoids, for your CBDs and your, your other um, cannabinoids that are used for all different types of purposes. But those two plants are very, very different. I have an example here of, of a CBD stock and you can kind of see that this plant is uh, is super thick and it, it, its fiber doesn't really peel off of it because it's mm -hmm. been dried to cure the flower. You know, flower is the, the big floral material is what these plants are gonna be produced for. So you got a bunch of flower up on top of this stalk and that's what's gonna, uh, you know, the plant's been bred to hold the weight of all those flowers. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, it makes sense now. Yeah, so it's, it's just a different material compared to your traditional fiber stalk which is a long single stalk. You know, you can see where all these branches were coming off of this guy. Those don't contain the same amount of fiber and herd mm -hmm. that this does. And then this guy's growing about four to six feet tall max usually. And this guy's growing eight to 14 feet tall. Um, and so it's just, a, and these guys are spread out, you know, with two foot spacing, four foot spacing, whatever it may be. These guys have a few inches in between them. so. As far as the amount of material coming off the field and then what you're able to do with those materials, this material is a much more ideal feedstock for our decortication uh, processes. And then what decortication is, is uh, you can see here's the, the stock of the hemp plant and this is with the fiber still on there. And here's, this is the logo of our company right here. So kind of an explainer tool. You got your fiber on the outside and then you got your herd on the inside. And then in the center here, you have a hollow pith. And that's kind of what makes it even easier to break and separate is that hollow pith on the inside. But what we do, the process of decortication is separating that fiber from the herd. So what we want to do is strip clean the uh, outer fiber from the inner woody core. And then from there, we further refine those two materials and clean them so that they can be used in other applications and it's kind of a gray area where the decortication actually happens whether that's when the fiber and herd is separated or that's when they are cleaned and refined i mean technically decortication is when they're separated um, but what's really missing in a lot of decortication systems is that further cleaning and refinement to get it to a ready to market and sell material um, or something that can be used in further upstream processes to manufacture other finished goods from those materials, but uh, decortication is that process. It used to be done by hand um, for a long, long time, and that's those technologies I'm talking about in Europe and China is what is being used to this day uh, for um, current processing. What are the applications between the herd and the fiber? So the herd and the fiber are made up of different um, chemical components. That's what makes it uh, much more useful when they're separated is that you can do specific applications with certain things. The fibers notably um, are used, you know, historically in things like rope and, and canvas. The word canvas comes from the word cannabis. Um, my shirt here is made out of industrial hemp fibers, um, but that is, uh, you know, the big application that everyone's aware of is, is the uh, textile or the um, being able to use it in cordage and those kinds of things. But what you can also do with it is take it and uh, um, mix it with either other fibers or with a um, other blends. They're called composites or, or anything of that nature. Uh, and you can make um, mats with it. So you can take it and turn it into a mat, which can be again turned into a host of other products from skateboards to surfboards to hot tubs or anything of that like. And you can also do things like um, a hydroponic mat or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. So you can, they're called non-wovens. It's a whole uh, um, class of materials. Paper is a non-woven. It's basically taking the fibers and dispersing them and then re-configuring uh, them in some sort of uh, 
pattern that will hold them together. And so that's the, the application of the fiber is, uh, you know, extensive beyond that. They use it for reinst uh, reinforcement fiber for um, concrete. They use it for all sorts of, you know, back in the day, they used to take the tow, the short fibers, and they mix it with tar and make boats waterproof. Um, so it's extremely uh, highly versatile, but its most notable application is in textiles. Um, and then the herd material uh, essentially is very high in cellulose. Um, and it's much lower in, in the glues that hold it together, so it's easier to break down, which makes it ideal for pulping, for applications like paper or cardboard or specialty pulps. Um, but then it's also able to be used, it's got a light uh, um, kind of balsa wood feel to it, um, but it's got all these nooks and crannies inside of it. And so it's a really good absorbent material, but it's also a really good host for absorbing and, and holding things too. Um, one of the major applications it's used for is building. Uh, they do a, a mixture of hemp and lime and water called hemp lime or hemp crete, and that actually uses that uh, the natural absorbency of the hemp to lock in all that lime and water, and it re solidifies that lime and turns it into a uh, basically a big calcified brick, or you know, it, it calcifies the herd, essentially petrifying the the material and turning it into a uh, um, like a stone, so it's it's um, fireproof, pestproof, uh, antimicrobial things of that nature. But the herd can also be uh, flattened into a like an MDF and and turned into a uh, you know any sort of um, uh, material for uh, cladding or decorational or uh, substitute for some lumber applications. Um, and then the cool thing about this herd material is we can also take it and make it very small so as as well as this is used for animal bedding things of that nature we can take we can reduce the size so you increase the surface area which increases the absorbency so products like this is what we use for our canazorb um, but we can also take the herd and make it into a really fine powder uh, taking it down to you know the micron level and that material can be what's called compounded into um, other resins and, and polymers. So it can be, uh, this is a PLA hemp blend. So this is, this is about 30% of this powder mixed with PLA, polylactic acid, fermented cornstarch. So this is 100% bio-based uh, substitute or replacement to traditional petroleum-based plastics. And we can take this and either turn it into a 3D printing filament and print things like this logo or you can take it and injection mold it into products like mm. golf tees for example which are made out of that hemp material there and uh so this is kind of the uh, this is what people refer to as hemp plastic sometimes and it literally is a blend of hemp and plastic called a biocomposite blend um, but then the other application would be to turn this woody material itself straight into a 100% hemp um, plastic replacement. And that is our, our long-term goal, but that's something that isn't really um, capable with the uh, existing supply chains and, and material available now. So we're finding ways to make it go longer and into more products. But uh, that is kind of uh, a breakdown, brief breakdown of what you can make from, and essentially I'd say anything you can do with petrochemicals, timber, or cotton, you can do uh, pretty effectively with the, the materials provided by the hemp stock. Um, how hard is it to grow hemp? Because I remember when you were at my house and you had some uh, customer call you and obviously we're not gonna talk specifics, but uh, you guys specifically talk about different areas of land if it's, I guess, adaptable. Uh, where can it have generally be grown and what do you need, meaning of like soil? Do you have to get it prepared a certain way or? Right. Um, so hemp is a uh, historically very hardy plant. Uh, that's why it's been cultivated, you know, um, as you know, it used to be called the frontier crop or uh, nature's nylon, things of that nature, uh, um, because it is so resilient. Uh, hemp does have um, preferred conditions. It grows optimally in uh, soft, loamy soil, so its roots can spread quickly. It's got a deep tap root, so it doesn't like to uh, live in highly compacted clay soils, things of that nature. Um, but no, hemp, uh, it's got lots of 
cultivars that can be bred to be um, very competitive or very successful at all different regions and climates and elevations around the world. It grows everywhere from, uh, you know, the Yangtze Valley in China, where it came from, to the Mississippi River Valley, um, you know, and it's been cultivated everywhere in between uh, for applications ranging from, you know, its, its grain to its floral material to its fiber, um, but it is most hardy when grown for fiber, uh, in my opinion, because it doesn't need the extra care um, or the extra upkeep or the extra harvesting practices, you know, to collect the grain or to collect the flower material or anything of that nature. Um, and so kind of the most hands-off, the most traditional, the oldest style of hemp cultivation is, is for its fiber. Um, and it's, it's grown and harvested very similar to uh, a hay product. It's you know, it got this very similar time length or um, uh, growth cycle as well planted. In How long does it take usually from the whole growth cycle? Right, so you plant it typically, and, and this depends on your, your region, but I say for the largest, for the Midwest, you, know, you plant in May, you harvest in uh, September. Um, and so it is a uh, 90 to 120 day growth cycle. Traditionally, if we're growing for fiber specifically, we'll cut it earlier because we're not waiting for it to go to full maturity and uh, begin its you know um, life cycle of putting out seeds and all those kinds of things. When you are growing for grain or for floral material, it can be extended because um, you are waiting for that to go all the way to full maturity. But that's kind of uh, the unique nature of hemp for fiber being an ideal rotation crop and, and uh, having a shorter growth cycle because you're just waiting for the, the fiber production itself. So how hard would it be for somebody that let's say just has an acre to play around with and would that be possible for them to plant, let's say in May, they have no experience at all, but they got maybe good seeds from somebody when it comes to hemp fiber, how hard would it be to, I guess, the labor uh, side of taking care of and all that? There's not much. It's a very hands-off crop. As far as what make like an ideal uh, hemp fiber farmer, an acre might be uh, a really small piece of land to get. You could probably make uh, it make more sense to do. You know, if you just had an acre to uh, to farm, uh, hemp for fiber production is more of a, a large-scale commercial venture. And you know, ideal farmer would have ten to fifty to even more. Uh, acres. Um, think about farmers that grow hay. You know, it's a large scale operation. Typically, you wouldn't do one acre of hay, uh, most likely, unless you just had, a, you know, it was just your house that you're feeding cattle for or something like that. But that is, um, it's very easy. I mean, you, you, you use very traditional um, planting uh, methods, you know, broadcast spreader or a corn drill or something like that. Um, it's, it's planted by seed, so it's not clones or anything of that nature. Um, and then, you know, you have a good high germination rate. And, and once the plant creates a, uh, um, a green carpet, it's called, you know, a, a two inch canopy, uh, hemp is very successful as long as there's not a, you know, dramatic environmental catastrophe or something of that nature. Once the, the hemp fiber um, has established a root ball about the size of a golf ball and has about a four inch canopy. Um, it has a very high success rate past that point. Um, the thing that's held back most farmers is getting the seed late and not getting the plant in at the um, most optimal time and not getting um, optimal yields because of that. So that's something that we're working towards, you know, making sure when we do engage that the farmers get the seeds um, at the right time, they have confidence in, in the uh, crop that they're growing and they know exactly where it will be going once they do harvest it. Um, can we talk a little bit about the supply chain? And obviously I always tag you on LinkedIn because there's a lot of uh, posts with fiber and it kind of gets confusing for me because I learned the basis from you. And what they're even speaking, a lot of people are talking about, and you mentioned it too, they're like, uh, it's missing a few points. Uh, so I want to talk about cover. First thing is, why does it feel like U.S. is behind when it comes to processing or even technology in hemp? And do you see that from your perspective? 
Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I have a very can-do American attitude and uh, I love this country and I think we do it the best. So I, I'm a little biased on, on lots of uh, um, people ask me, you know, are we behind things of that nature? I, I don't think we are. I think we're just going about it the wrong way. Um, but as far as, um, you know, why we're behind, um, it's, it's a fault of our own. We've, we've hindered ourselves through regulation. Hemp has been outlawed here for, uh, you know, the last 85 years or so in one way or another. And that um, hindrance in production of the raw material has definitely resulted in, in a hindrance of, of developing better and, and more American ways to process industrial hemp. And uh, we chose as a country a long time ago, our natural fiber of choice was cotton. And uh, we are the best cotton uh, producers and manufacturers and, and equipment uh, designers in the world. You know, American cotton processing equipment is used all over the world. And there is uh, lots of similarities in what we do to uh, um, improve hemp fibers that you would adapt maybe from other natural fiber processing technologies as they've done in Europe from flax to hemp or from other fibers. Uh, we have the same abilities here. We just haven't had the same monetary incentive uh, because up until recently hemp has been uh, illegal to cultivate and produce for these materials. Um, but you know, we saw that law change in 2018 and since then there's already been um, movers here in the States, um, but unfortunately many of them have looked, again in my opinion, a little too far back in history to figure out um, what maybe the best way and most optimal way to be processing this plant for its fiber is. Um, and so that's kind of uh, where things are at. People are debating how to skin the cat and there's a thousand ways to do it. And um, what is confusing is that once you kind of start with a certain method, um, you have to go into other processes that only line up with that method. You can't be in long line linen processing and go into cotton spinning. You know, you have to kind of choose a path, how you're going to process it, and then how the downstream processes will be handled. And uh, you, it, you can't go from one to the other. The material, it doesn't uh, uh, make sense. And, and one thing around the world that it won't, the tech, existing technologies don't apply to what we do is that they do things very labor intensively. Um, and we don't have that kind of inexpensive labor here in the United States. Um, and we do things on a much larger scale. So much of the machinery that's being developed and designed, um, one of the biggest kind of, uh, you know, why I don't line up with how they're doing it is their systems are orient fed, which means you need each one of these hemp stocks to be facing the same direction and fed in at a very slow rate, um, which minimizes your throughput, minimizes your ability to really commercialize this process. And so um, our key, you know, and my, my key uh, driver in, in improving this supply chain has been adapting technologies that will sync very easily with our existing agricultural practices here in the United States, which is large scale. Uh, nothing's done uh, small. I mean, when you look at cotton processing, they they feed 20 ton modules into their systems like these, these things are the size of semi trucks they're, they're 20 tons of, of fiber going into their refinement system we, we're processing 900 pound bales so just very uh you know but but even at that we're doing 900 pound bales we're not doing one stock at a time and so you re, we're trying to find the right balance of of throughput and, and uh, uh, we have to make it make sense economically. Uh, if there's not an ROI uh, that makes sense for investors, then it's not going to be invested in. And that's, that's where a lot of the hindrance is, is that these existing systems out there um, are either too expensive to run or they cost too much to make it make sense for what materials coming out of it, uh, where the market price is too low to, um, you know, warrant an investment in those technologies. And that's what you guys are doing, right? That it, our, our sole purpose, is, besides further developing out the markets, um, is to develop commercially viable uh, decortication systems 
that are you know turnkey um, that we can guarantee the, the materials that are coming out of it being able to have you know some sort of oversight of the materials going into it um, but that is our uh, sole purpose is to um, drastically disrupt and simplify the processing of hemp stocks into viable consumer products and so we are doing that through um, American innovation and uh, improving upon technologies that we already use here in the United States for other applications and then building on to that with some some specific uh, uh, application built machinery as well to so what was the right word I think you used last time like proprietary so whatever you're doing uh farmers and other business owners are going to be able to attach that system to whatever existing system they have yeah that, that's the hopes yeah so th i mean they're already doing what they do they grow they harvest they bale mm -hmm. and we want to just come into them what well, they already grow another crop we want to come and offer them a very simple transition to uh being able to grow for hemp fiber and uh that's kind of you know we've Id identified the, the most fit farmers uh for fiber cultivation where the, you know when i say fit i mean that they're not going to have to buy another piece of equipment because they already own all the equipment that they need mm -hmm. for another crop and it's going to apply to hemp and uh, they've got the right type of land they've got you know uh they've either shown interest or they they've expressed in some way shape or form that they would be interested in in cultivating hemp but farmers are very you know they need to see the numbers they're not taking risks on what they're growing um they're not going to see trends in the market and say, mm, cassava roots really taken off. I'm going to, they, they need to have a processor and a producer and a contract in place. Uh, Cause that's where the dangers and, and kind of the pitfalls we've seen in the CBD space have come from is, is with that misorganization in the supply chain and, and farmers grown more or less than what, you know, the market can uptake is um, things like that. But uh, we, fiber is even tougher because if you grow fiber, you know, that, that produces, has the ability to produce upwards of eight tons an acre. And uh, unlike floral material or grain, that's a lot harder to store and a lot, you know, takes up a lot more space. So you gotta have somewhere to go with it or you're gonna have some angry farmers. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, you actually partnering with John Lucan, who's also uh, you talked about him. I listened to a previous podcast too. He's a pioneer in the space. Uh, I want to talk about how do you, how did you get him on your board, and what did you learn from him? Because just listening to podcasts with him kind of blew my mind, and that's why I asked you a lot of questions as well beforehand. So, um, speak a little bit about that. Absolutely. Me and John have very similar passion in the hemp space. People ask a lot of times, why? You know, what's your why? And um, both of us can tell you it's not money because there's no money in it. <laughs> um, but no, I, uh, um, John has had a incredible career in the hemp space, um, largely in part because he's still in it somehow. Uh, you know, there's not many people that, you know, you have to really find the value that you're adding to the space to maintain your position for as long as he has. And he is an expert in the fiber processing and creating his, you know, his decortication system, uh, he's an expert, I call him the uh, Eli Whitney of hemp. Um, he is going to bring us into, you know, the new age of, of hemp fiber production and commercially viable, you know, economically viable uh, systems. And uh, he's worked with the USDA uh, and the fiber ginning labs. And he's got a really keen knowledge and awareness of all the other fibers and, and why hemp is able to do what it is able to do and how to get it to do those things um, but he's also um, ironically uh, in my previous employer he was our largest domestic competitor and so um, he you know has a, has a reputation uh, for getting things done and, and taking things to to the next level as far as uh, size and scale and uh, he's the only person in the United States that's taken a domestically grown hemp fiber to textile grade um, and he, he knows uh, those downstream processes and on top of that he is a hemp history buff um, so we we get um, uh, diverted from our um, main focus sometimes when we get engaged in uh, long discussions about the history of 
hemp and, and its impact on, you know, pre-Columbian trade, all these wild things. Um, but that is uh, uh, where we sync up a lot. But ironically, John had uh, parted from his previous company and um, I myself was working on other projects and that is how we uh, were able to link up and have found much um, uh, synergy between each other and from there have expanded our team to uh, several other um, players in the space which I highly admire and uh, it's, it's going to have to be like that there's such a wide breadth and depth of knowledge necessary to be able to take something all the way from crop to shop and to be able to do that in one organization while maintaining enough of that profit to make it make sense uh, it takes that kind of um, like knowledge and, and know-how to to get that done. Uh, can you talk about, I guess, the forecast of the hemp supply chain, the myths, the, I guess, the what's called the bandwagon that everybody is going after? Is there really money? What should you be focusing on? And then maybe you talk a little bit about the trends uh, for a few years ahead and what's uh, coming to the market. Yeah, it, it's, I, I feel like it's coming no matter what there's a uh, hemp has an interest like no other crop that's ever come onto the or are we still focusing with sorry to interrupt are we still focusing on cbd too much versus the application of hemp because you've personally opened my eyes and hemp and i was more into the cbd and the health aspects of it all the uh when it comes to that but once you open the eyes uh what you could do with the fiber uh i definitely started i guess riding the bandwagon as well mm -hmm. well the 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 Trajectory in my mind is um, the cultivation of, of floral material on at this kind of scale, a very horticulturally intensive uh, small scale. Um, I, I believe this will continue to become more and more specialized and more difficult to be a new, you know, to become involved in. Uh, I, I think that auto you really, just can't sell CBD oil anymore. <laughs> right. It's good. You know, and, and marketers are the ones that are making the bottom dollar on that. Unless you have a way to get it out to the market, it's very tough to be selling the raw, you know, the floral material or anything like that. The price is just, you know, dropping so much and, and things are changing so quickly in that space and the market's hard to judge. Um, but where I see things going on you know at least outdoor large-scale cultivation is a much higher focus on dual purpose um, and what a dual purpose means is that you're able to get uh, two of these applications which you traditionally hear about either grain or fiber or floral and fiber or even a tri crop where you're getting grain and floral and fiber material um, but you know in Europe most uh, hemp cultivation is is dual purpose or just for fiber but you, you, you don't often see um, small hemp bushes uh, we call diet marijuana uh, because they they are very similar to the uh, um, production of medicinal cannabis um, but it's just a, a variety that lacks the uh, THC or they grow it and they'll remediate the THC out um, but that that style of cultivation in my opinion is is a little um, short-sighted and it's people racing after securing those markets in the floral material but um, a dual purpose crop that is very popular is the floral fiber variety and what you have there basically and I'm, I'm just making this but basically you have a single stock variety with a flower or, or a large floral material on top and what they'll do to make the most worth out of this plant is come by with a dual harvesters so it'll either do both at once it'll cut those stalks and the flower and collect the flower or it'll do the flower on one pass and then come back and do the stock but what you're able to do then is grow your floral material at a much denser ratio so you're getting less flower you're getting way way more flower but a little bit less percentage of the cannabinoid in there but in the long run it's much 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 less expensive to produce cbd this way or you know cannabinoid material but that being said, you can't do the specialty varieties and the, the niche, you know, other cannabinoids um, on this kind of scale because the genetics haven't been developed. So three to five years, I believe you'll see a lot more dual purpose. You'll see new harvesting mechanisms, not only for dual purpose CBD or dual purpose floral and fiber, but also dual purpose grain and fiber. 
um, they've been growing, you know, grain material up in Canada for a long time, but have had uh, an inability to make their fiber and herd uh, processing cost effective enough to even go collect that fiber or uh, to make anything from it. And that's another thing that, you know, I've used to um, best learn the do's and don'ts of, of hemp is looking at other countries that have made large uh, either state backed investments or just private investments, whether that's Germany in the nineties or Canada in the two thousands. Um, it will be the United States in the 2020s, but, uh, that is, um, another really good space to learn about how these markets might, might go. But uh, I do believe there is way too high of a focus on the cannabinoids, um, and their production and, and that supply chain. It's, it's been overkill. Um, and then, um, where we need the focus is further processing the grain to higher applications. So it's, it's thought of like pea proteins and other things and can be infused into every product like they do with those other plant proteins. And then with the fiber side, um, once their edge large scale fiber applications and uses and markets developed, uh, people will be much more um, incentivized into growing that dual purpose. And keep in mind, when you talk about the environmental benefits and all the things that people love to tout about hemp, this variety does not store all the carbon that you, you know, it does not uh, have a That's deep a CBD. Yeah, this is the, the for the floor. When you think of those little bushes, um, they're not quite as uh, environmentally friendly as they might be advertised uh, as the other cultivars of hemp uh, are. And so that is long term, you know, that's my hopes is that more um, traditional uh, farmers, you know, uh, guys with big acreage and already put a bunch of money into big infrastructure and machines are able to use that for this other uh, type of hemp production that I believe, um, you know, it, it has two really healthy environmental impacts, not only when the material is grown, but then we're turning this material into usable products. So people are getting that, it's a you know, double experience. They're getting a healthy, environmentally conscious products in their lives now as well. And that carbon that was sequestered is not being burned up or anything. It's being saved and stored in those products or in those building materials. And so it's really a much more complete uh, story and a, and, a, and, and a better application of the plant, in my opinion. Um, let's talk a little bit about the cost. Uh, let's go into, I guess, I had a few questions. Maybe we could run through because a lot of people are curious about the cost of setting up something like a grow or even what do you need in terms of size, facility, to grow fiber, to make something out of it. Because a lot of people, I guess, have land and they just want to grow it. But then when it comes to the end product and what they're going to do with it, they have no clue. Right. Um, and that's a tough. That or, is maybe, a tough or, or maybe like this. Let's put an example of a smaller scale, right? Uh, let's say somebody has a house, a family or something, maybe an acre. What can you, is it, is it worth it to grow hemp? What can they do personally mm -hmm. from it? In my you know, I, I never want to uh, inhibit anybody from chasing down something. Um, but my goal is not to create a cottage industry. And that's kind of where the disconnect comes with mm. uh, a lot of people as well is that I totally I, I support doing small acreage and, you know, small fiber processing. And, and there's systems for that. And if you reach out to me, I can recommend you to, you know, small, it would almost I'd almost probably recommend you to do it by hand, because it's gonna be cheaper and at the same scale almost. But uh, our goal at Hemp Ventures and, and my goal personally is to create a, you know, a displacement for fossil fuels, a displacement for cotton and petro and other harmful, unsustainable uh, materials. And to do that, you can't compete on a cottage industry level. Uh, you have to build something that is mons Everything we do nowadays is, is on a scale that is just un believable. Uh, when I talk about cotton processing, it used to be done with a gin, you know, by the pound, and now it's done in a 20-ton module. And so we are having to take hemp processing and inject it with American industrial might to a level like you've never seen before, because it has to skip 85 years of natural progression and development, and it has to compete on a market, which is 
more competitive and more corrupt than it's ever been. And so that is the, uh, the nature of the beast is that we have to make something that's going to compete. And to do that, um, I tell a lot of people, no, I don't recommend getting into hemp fiber. Uh, it is uh, not an easy um, you know, endeavor. And it's, it's not really something that you would do at small scale to make a profit. Um, and that's why you see so many people getting into other avenues of the hemp plant because the, the fiber is the biggest risk, hardest hurdle, but in my opinion has the longest and highest trajectory and the most reward, uh, not only for our company, but for the world as a whole. And, uh, you know, I believe, I don't even, I, I know for a fact <laughs> it was the largest cash crop in the world used by countless civilizations used by you know pre prehistoric you know it was the first cultivated you know domesticated fiber crop and uh it's beyond suspicious that it doesn't play a more major role in the world today and i believe once people know the story behind why that is it'll be marketing that will carry this base past what people thought possible very quickly uh before we go i still wanted to kind of run around like the cost and i guess scratch people's head a little bit um how much does it cost to build a hemp pump right now from hempcrete and how far are we from the whole aspect of where it's normal to hey i want a hemp pump absolutely hempcrete uh, hemp so let's let's perfect. give you let's give you like a basic family three bedroom four bedroom yeah. you know as far as cost, I'd say it's 30% more than traditional building. Um, and that's on average. And that's, you know, because your materials are having to get moved and all these kind of things like that. But the mm -hmm. highest cost of a hemp building right now um, is the labor. And that's because systems haven't been developed to optimize the, uh, this new building material. They're having to mix it and cast it on site, which is, is very labor intensive. Um, and so where I see that going uh, is, is um, SIP panels and precast systems. So where our fiber processing is happening, where our herd is being separated and cleaned, we would turn those, that material into a precast system, which would then be able to be installed uh, much quicker. And, you know, it's readily available when someone's ready to move on a house, so you don't have to stockpile materials, things of that nature. Um, and that will significantly bring the cost down. Um, but there, is, there are many groups, uh, including the USHBA um, and, and several building groups here in the United States that are looking to greatly reducing that cost and making it a much more uh, um, viable building method. But I believe it'll be in short time because the, the drive is so there to make it happen. Um, so by how hemp is processed and in terms of just the general aspect, do you see it as, you're familiar with circular economy yeah. of kind of reusing that. Do you see hemp as, I mean, it's going to sound utopian, but from what we just talked about, I just see it as a whole bunch of almost like mini towns in suburban cities. Let's say for Denver, there's going to be a whole bunch of mini hemp towns that supply towns in different cities with supplies that they need. Do you see that in the future as well? Because when I look at it right now, like you said, uh, building a hemp house, I just look at it as a supply chain and obviously we don't have enough, like you said, labor intensive and cost effective when it comes to getting the supplies in different areas. Mm -hmm. So when I was looking at, and we talked about this in person from a utopian standpoint, I just see hemp as having its own like micro city and supporting different towns and different, I guess, uh, people from it. Where do you see that? Do you see something, I guess, of that utopia nature coming together, developing? I, I believe it is the ultimate rural economy catalyst to bring more industry. Um, it is very expensive to move and makes much more sense on a business standpoint to get it to the highest value as close as you can to where it's produced. Um, I'm not going to delve back into the history of hemp, but that is what made it so dangerous long ago. Uh, when there was colonizers that had the same fears that their their young colonies might become so self-sufficient that they might not call back <laughs> and uh, i believe 
wholeheartedly. That is why we don't produce hemp to this day. And that is what I'm looking to overturn. Because I uh, want. Before I want we go, can you talk about uh, Hemp Ventures, what you're doing there? What can people reach out for you? Uh, what services are you providing currently? Uh, your future plans, maybe some peek at uh, what you're working on too. Yeah, absolutely. So our, our, my name is Ryan Doherty. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of Hemp Ventures. And uh, you can reach out to us at uh, hempventures.org or we're at uh, on Instagram and Facebook at hemp.ventures. And our services include, um, we, we, do, we are not selling our decortication system that we're developing, but we are um, looking to partner up with people to bring it to uh, regions. The reason we don't want to sell it is because we want to get, make sure it's 100% successful. We want to engage in bringing you a whole supply chain solution. There's some, several companies out there just selling machines, and I believe it's um, a little uh, premature when they don't know what genetic of plant is going into it. They don't know what products are coming out of it. We want to, you know, down the road, we do see ourselves selling these systems, but not until we optimize them further, reduce their cost more, and uh, we can ensure 100% success of them. Um, we also uh, assist with product development. So say you want to make something out of hemp, you want to figure out what material you need, how to best do that, what, what the benefits are um, of using it. Well, that's something we can help with. And then also um, just market and, and business plan development and further, you know, if you're looking to get into hemp fiber processing or the space um, in any way, uh, you know, as, as a downstream manufacturer of the material, as a farmer that wants to be an input, uh, we can greatly uh, help, you know, in identifying where that makes the most sense for you and how it makes the most sense to engage in your region. You know, I help lots of people find the right genetics to do test trial plots or to, um, you know, help state governments identify uh, economic impacts of, of bringing industrial hemp for grain and fiber applications. I'm working with the state of Virginia uh, in a three county region there to do just that um, and several other regions around the United States to um, quantify and, and give them a clearer picture into what industrial hemp fiber production looks like, how it can impact their local economy um, and how that can be a long-term driver for their ag and for their you know other industries in their area so that's uh and as far as what we're developing um our, our specialty really is uh taking this herd to micronizations and taking this fiber to textile so hopefully here in short order we'll be disclosing who we're working with to take this fiber to a uh you know textile grade material which will be in some sort of clothing application um, and then the herd, uh, we are doing uh, compounding to make uh, other uh, materials. And then we are looking to um, in-house, one thing we have been working on development is a method for um, turning the herd into a cellulosic fiber as well. So that's uh, something that we have in developments um, that we are um, looking to get to a scalable uh, practice so that we can bring that material to market as well. But uh, aside from that, uh, just introducing the possibility of hemp fiber cultivation to more regions, specifically here in Colorado. Any uh, wise words uh, for the hemp community or for the cannabis community? What should we focus on? Any recommendations? And uh, for the people that are trying to, I guess, quote unquote, change the world, get into the hemp industries? Yeah, I would say um, pick your product. Uh, be realistic, build a business plan. Uh, put, you're trying to convince people that this is a real industry. So um, spouting more facts and more unbased myths or um, uh, just being an advocate without anything to back it up doesn't do a whole lot for the space. Um, I would say come with facts, come with a product that will be profitable and will compete um, because everything else is there. Uh, what we need, or I mean, or if you're an engineer, um, 
build it better because uh, there is a desperate need for processing and infrastructure improvements worldwide. Um, that's what our sole goal is, but uh, I want anybody and everyone to be successful in this. My, what I always think of in the hemp space, because there's a lot of competition, whether friendly or not, um, but I want everyone to be behind what we are doing. I want anyone that feels the same way to get up next to us, but I'll warn anyone right now not to get in our way. <laughs> so that, that's how I feel about it. Well, thanks, Ryan, for uh, that was an educational hour. Uh, fried my brain for sure. Uh, was, uh, thanks for uh, spending this time and educating everybody. And uh, can't wait to speak to you again, man. Absolutely. You have a good one.